Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Washington Hebrew Congregation's Amram Scholar Series. Uh, I'm Rabbi Sue Shankman. I'm delighted to be with you all this morning for our Amram Scholar Series. And just a reminder what this Scholar Series is. Our Amram Scholar Series offers a stimulating program of free lectures throughout the year in which world-renowned speakers, authors, scholars, political leaders, policy analysts, and theologians share their perspectives on timely issues or their research into history. This program traces its roots to the fall of 1954 when Washington Hebrew Congregation moved into our current home on Macomb Street. That fall, participating in a nationwide celebration that marked the 300th anniversary of Jewish settlement in the United States, the Temple launched what would become this widely recognized Sunday morning lecture program. Today's lecture is in partnership with the Jewish Book Council, and we're grateful for the opportunity to work in partnership with the Jewish Book Council to bring both Nick Davis and Noah Eisenberg to you virtually this morning. And we encourage you to purchase their books through our WHC Mitzvah Mall. And I am going to post uh, the links to both of those books in our chat right now. Hopefully you'll be able to see both of those. Um, and encourage you, and I'll remind you again later to um, to be sure. And I'm sure you'll want to after after listening to our two authors this morning. So let's meet our two authors. Nick Davis is an award-winning director and producer. His latest film, Once Upon a Time in Queens, a four-hour documentary about the 1986 New York Mets, aired on ESPN's 30 for 30 series in September 2021. His book about his grandfather and great uncle competing with Id idiots, Herman and Joe Mankiewicz, a dual portrait public was published by Knopf in September, 2021. So he kept busy during, <laughs> during COVID. Among his other films are Ted Williams, The Greatest Hitter Who Ever Lived for PBS's American Master Series, Blood, Sweat and Gears, a documentary about a cycling team devoted to cleaning up its scandal ridden sport. Jack, The Last Kennedy Film, an, award, an Emmy Award-winning portrait of John F. Kennedy, and the acclaimed feature film 1999, starring Jennifer Garner, Dan Futterman, and Amanda Peet. His company, Nick Davis Productions, has produced over 75 hours of nonfiction and documentary programming for television since its founding in 2001, as well as over 300 films and videos for corporate, nonprofit, and other private clients. The third generation of his family in the entertainment business. Davis's first book was the novel Boone, written with Brooks Hansen, published in 1990, and named a notable book of the year by the New York Times. Previously, Nick Davis was a performer with Gotham City Improv and You and What Army, and he graduated from Harvard, where he founded the improv group On Thin Ice. He was born in New York City, where he lives with his wife, novelist Jane Mendelson, and their two amazing daughters. We'll hear from him in in just a few moments. Uh, but before we do, I also want to introduce our other speaker this morning, Noah Eisenberg. Noah Eisenberg is the George Christian Centennial Professor and Chair of the Department of Radio, Television, Film at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the author, most recently, of We'll Always Have Casablanca, The Life, Legend, and Afterlife of Hollywood's Most Beloved Movie, which was a Los Angeles Times bestseller. Among his other books, are Edgar G. Omar, a filmmaker at the margins, selected by Huffington Post as a best film book of 2014, Detour, uh, which was uh, in 2008, and as editor, Weimar Cinema, Cinema, an essential guide to classic films of the era, named a choice outstanding academic title. His uh, current projects will actually out, uh, include a book on Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot for Norton, and a short interpretive biography of Wilder for the Yale Jewish Live series. His latest anthology, Billy Wilder on Assignment, which he edited and introduced, has been selected by Tom Stoppard as a TLS 2021 Book of the Year and was named among the long-listed books for the 2022 Krasna Krauss Moving Image Book Awards. Um, we're delighted to have them both with us. I'm delighted also to have both of their books with me. Again, I encourage you in the chat, you have uh, the link. I'll posted again for those who may have joined us since that was added. Uh, and uh, and it's unusual that we have two speakers in, uh, in with us at the same time, but um, this was a, a wonderful opportunity 
to talk about an era and to talk about uh, Hollywood and the Jewish uh, influence and, and engagement in the industry. Um, so I wanna welcome both Nick and Noah, and they're each going to share an overview. Each will share an overview about his book and subject or subjects, depending, and then uh, we'll have a conversation. That conversation will include some uh, Q&A and some moderated conversation. So I invite those of you who are with us and listening to, um, if you have a question that you want me to pose to them, to send it to me directly in the chat. So if, just a reminder to do how to do that, if you go to the chat and you can look for my name and send a message directly uh, to me, uh, if, if it gets goes to everyone, that's fine. I'll see that that way too. It just helps. It's a little less distracting for our speakers if uh, if it goes directly to me. And uh, and we will. I'm looking forward to hearing this conversation and and seeing how uh, your topics overlap. And I know that it's um it's wonderful to have you here. We we would have preferred in person, uh, but we hope that in the future we'll have that opportunity. But for now. Uh, I'm looking forward now that I've uh, had a chance to really engage with your words to hear your perspective as you each share a little bit uh, about your your book and your um, your process and certainly your subject. So we're going to to begin with Nick. Um, and thank you. I'm going to take Noah off spotlight for now. Thank you, Nick. Uh, well, thank you, Rabbi Sue Sue. Uh... Sue or Rabbi. Um, thank you so much. It's great to be they here. Both yes, I, I answered to both. <laughs> okay, good, good. Well, thank you. That was a, a wonderful and generous introduction. And I'm so eager to uh, talk to Noah. Um, I, one of the things I reference all the time is the Epstein brothers, uh, who wrote Casablanca, um, because it took me 19 years to write this book, <laughs> from the time that I had uh, a book contract to delivery. And what I always thought was, if this were about the Epstein brothers, I'd have given back the tiny advance and, and thrown in the towel. But unfortunately, uh, it was about the Mankiewicz brothers. Um, and, and therefore, they were my family, and I couldn't abandon this project as much as at many times I wanted to. Um, so I have a, a quick little slideshow that I'll run through uh, to sort of just talk about what this book is. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll run that if I'm able to figure out how this, uh, how this works. So, um, the title of the book, Competing with Idiots, Herman and Joe Mankiewicz, Dual Portrait, uh, the Competing with Idiots part comes from a telegram that, uh, my grandfather, Herman Mankiewicz, sent back to his friend Ben Hecht, uh, from Hollywood when Herman first got out there. Herman and, and Ben Hecht had known each other in New York City. Herman was a journalist and larger than life kind of uh, wit. And, and obviously, as some of you may know, later became the subject of uh, the David Fincher movie, Mank, played by Gary Oldman. But when he first got out to Hollywood in the, uh, in the late 20s, in 1926, he sent back uh, Ben Hecht a telegram because Herman was sort of the first of the wave of Eastern uh, writers who had been lured out to Hollywood by the money. And he sent a telegram which said, will you accept 300 per week to work for Paramount Pictures? All expenses paid, 300 is peanuts, millions are to be grabbed out here and your only competition is idiots. Don't let this get around. And that became kind of, um, the, the, the through line for my book is, is about competing and it's about, uh, you know, thinking that everyone you're with is, is fundamentally an idiot, um, which Herman kind of did. Um, he was, as I said, a wonderful, convivial, warm-hearted uh, figure, but he was also uh, notoriously a, a drunk and very self-destructive. He drank himself into an early grave uh, at the age of 55 um, and, 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 you know, was fired repeatedly from every studio that he worked with. Um, uh, and, and at one point, actually, Dory Sherry at MGM uh, said, you know, you're not only fired from here, I'm going to make sure you don't work at any studio uh, in town. And Herman looked at him and said, promises, promises. He was a man who really thought Hollywood and, and the movies were beneath him. Um, and, and that was, you know, a fundamental to, to who he was and, and one of the things that was not so great about him. His brother, younger brother Joe, on the other hand, was a sort of paragon of success. 
Uh, he was 11 and a half years younger than Herman. He got out to Hollywood just a few years after Herman uh, and was very uh, steady in his ascent. Uh, he learned the game that Hollywood played. He appreciated the game uh, and understood it and thought it was worth playing and, and followed all the rules. Uh, whereas Herman uh, did not follow the rules and did not think much of Hollywood or the game. And obviously his one great achievement was hooking up with another sort of uh, notorious anti-authoritarian figure, Orson Welles, and writing the screenplay of, uh, of Citizen Kane. Um, how much of it Herman wrote, how much of it Orson wrote is an open question. According to my cousin Ben Mankiewicz, who is now the host of TCM, Herman wrote everything. Uh, and I'm not going to disagree with Ben. Uh, whereas Joe, um, so I should say, you know, when I was growing up, um, my um, idea of, of these two guys was, was formed at the age of, of seven or eight. Um, and, and I sort of inhaled the, the family mythology, which was Herman, your grandfather, was the greatest guy who ever lived. He was warm and wonderful, and he wrote the greatest movie of all time, Citizen Kane. Whereas Joe, on the other hand, we don't see very much. He lives about an hour away from us, but we don't see him. And, and the reason for that might be because he is responsible for the worst movie of all time, Cleopatra. And, and not only was it bad, but it, it essentially bankrupted a studio. And that's, you know, that's why we don't see Joe. I inherited this primarily from my mother, pictured here with Herman uh, when she was two years old. Um, but um, after Herman died, actually, when my mom was uh, 15, um, her uncle Joe took good care of her and did the sort of nice avuncular things. And in fact, there uh, he is walking her down the aisle um, on her wedding day in 1959. Um, but nonetheless, I always, to me, you know, Herman, it was all about Herman. And one mildly interesting thing for me, again, this is, you know, as, as uh, you know, if I'd written about the Epstein brothers, we would be having a very different talk. But I looked at Herman, uh, pictures of young Herman, and I thought, hey, wait a minute, that guy looks a little bit like me. Hey, I guess I have to become Herman Mankiewicz. Whereas um, Joe is, is not someone I have to become. And he's, he's in fact, sort of a, a, sh a black sheep of the family as I'm growing up. Then I graduated from college. And uh, the year after I graduated, I was, my dad invited me and I had nothing better to do than go to the French embassy and see Joe honored uh, and, and given a Légion d'honneur, some French award. And I thought, well, this is crazy. Why, why are they honoring this guy? All he did was, I'd heard of all about Eve, but really what I thought was he's not a great guy. And I, you know, and he bankrupted the studio. <clears throat> so I go and I meet him and can't really tell from that picture, but I think you can tell from this picture, this is a very warm, menschy seeming guy. And I, I thought, I don't understand. He was very nice to me and, and he, he knew who I was. And I'd only met him once or twice my entire life. Um, and, and so I was, I was really struck by, wait a minute, this guy seems great. And in fact, he seems a lot like my uncle Frank, who Washingtonians may remember, Frank Mankiewicz, uh, who was Bobby Kennedy's press secretary and uh, later worked for the McGovern campaign and NPR, a terrific man, Frank Mankiewicz. So here's Joe looking an awful lot like my beloved uncle Frank. What's going on here? So that's what kicked off my, uh, my, my journey to write this book all those years ago. Um, and I think, I mean, look, I, it, where, where it all came from ultimately was their father, Franz Mankiewicz, uh, Herman and Joe's father, who was an amazingly uh, stern and disciplinarian uh, academic from, from Germany, who never told the boys they loved them. If you brought home a 97 on a test, what happened to the other three points? And it's not funny, it's, there's no irony. It's like, really, what happened to the other three points? If you don't do perfect, I'm hardly gonna even notice you. Um, and so that became, in many ways, uh, I'm, I'm rushing through this, but that, you know, sort of that idea of, of parental love, which you can never have, uh, became, you know, the, the genesis for the rosebud symbol in Citizen Kane. Herman had a bike that his father never replaced. 
and and that was uh, the rosebud uh, in Herman's life. Um, and and so you know, there's Herman with his Oscar. There's Joe on the set of All About Eve, and and that's really uh, you know, in a nutshell, sort of what drove me to to write this book. And part of one other thing I want to say before I yield to Noah, uh, gratefully, um, is you know, I I couldn't compete with these guys. I didn't want to be a writer. I, you can't. You can't. You can't compete with these guys. So. I became a documentary filmmaker and I went to American Masters in 2002 and I said, hey, I have an idea for, for a, a film about Herman and Joe Mankiewicz. Um, and fundamentally, uh, that idea came from uh, my conception of All About Eve, which is Joe's greatest masterpiece. And by the way, I, I was an idiot not to know how great All About Eve was when I was growing up um, because it's one of the greatest screenplays ever written and it's a fantastically entertaining movie about a cold ambitious younger artist who tries to usurp and take down the older more beloved self-destructive charismatic artist Eve Harrington and Margot Channing uh, Betty Davis and it occurred to me wait a minute and it occurred to me courtesy of my wife who has all the good ideas in the family hey that's an emotional autobiography on the part of of Joe he's writing about him and Herman whether he knows it or not so I went to American Masters. They said, oh, that's interesting. Let's do a documentary on that. They gave me a little bit of money. I started interviews um, in, in audio only. They didn't give me enough money for a camera. And uh, in 2002, I set about on this project. Um, and then that winter, ran into a friend at a Christmas party who's a book agent. I told him about it. He said, oh, you should do a companion book. So all these years later, uh, the documentary still hasn't happened because movie clips are so expensive to license, uh, but I was left with this book contract uh, that I said, if it was about the, you know, the Whites brothers, the Cohen brothers, the Epstein brothers, I would have walked away from, uh, but because it was the Mankiewicz's, I simply couldn't. So that, in a nutshell, is the story behind Competing with Idiots, um, and, uh, but I, I look forward to talking about Hollywood in that time uh, when, uh, whenever uh, Noah is finished with his colloquy. <laughs> Nick, thank you so much. And certainly I, I have questions already um, bubbling and we'll, we'll get to that after, after Noah has an opportunity to share. And uh, before Noah begins, I just wanna remind those of you who have joined us um, uh, since we, we started, I'm going to place a link to both books in the chat, a uh, link through our, our mitzvah mall to um, purchase the books on Amazon, um, and we will have a chance for, uh, for there, there's going to be some conversation uh, between Nick and Noah, um, which I will moderate, but I also hope that some of you will, will share questions with me uh, through the chat function so that we can continue this, this conversation. So Noah, thank you, and take it away. Thank you for, for the introduction. Thank you, Nick, for setting things in motion. And we will have that conversation in just a bit. I'm going to take your lead, Nick, and just talk a little bit about the book. Um, and then I'll walk you through some, I also have some images and I have a, a short clip from a, a film that the young Billy Wilder, when living in Weimar era Berlin, um, that he wrote and, and that I think really captures, I think, the, the, the sensibility that we know from his later pictures. Um, but, but here we have a, a 20 something Wilder, uh, very scrappy, uh, working as a freelance uh, journalist, even as a dancer for hire. Um, and then, and then, uh, dashing off, uh, screenplays, this one, uh, purportedly on, uh, uh on scrap paper at the Romanisches Café and Kufristendam, the famous cafe where, uh, a lot of the Weimar intelligentsia, uh, gathered theater people, music people, and so forth. So. I'll get to that in just a second, but the project, so I was a graduate student at Berkeley in the 1990s, and um, I came across this, this, this book that was called The Prince von Wales Geht auf Urlaub, The Prince of Wales Goes on Holiday. It was a collection of Wilder's journalism, and I was so taken with the, the, the writing and just thought, wow, this is amazing. Why doesn't it exist in English? And so I was lucky enough to pair, pair up with, with Shelley Frisch, who's an award-winning translator, really amazing. And, uh, and in fact, I think this book in the meantime has also been, been, I know it's been nominated for a number of prizes on the basis of the translation, but Shelley really is the one to be credited with, with bringing this now to an Anglo-American audience. Um, 
in the meantime now it just came out in, in Spanish it'll be out in Portuguese and and then soon in Italian so I'm very very excited that Wilder's work is reaching a new audience so that was really the impetus behind this is that I thought why should I as somebody who'd lived in in in, in and studied and worked in in Germany and Austria for so many years and because I have facility with that language, why should I be <laughs> uh, 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 allowed to, to, to read these, these, these wonderful texts and not people who, do, who don't have facility with uh, the German language? So thanks to Shelley, um, Young Wilder's journalism is now available to an Anglo-American audience. And so I'm going to share a screen. I'll take you through uh, a few. Everybody sees this just fine now? Um, yes. Great, thank you. So he began when he wasn't even quite 20 years old, uh, young Billy, still spelling his name as you see at the bottom of the crossword puzzle, B-I-L-L-I-E. He then Americanized it when he crossed the Atlantic in 1934. Um, but he, 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 he supplied crossword puzzles and short pieces, capsule reviews to the two tabloids in, in Vienna at that time. Um, die Bühne, the stage, as well as Die Stunde, the hour. These are both uh, tabloids run by a somewhat shifty Hungarian newspaper magnate by the name, magnate by the name of Imre, uh, uh, Imre Kertes. Anyway, so, so, so uh, Wilder contributed to these pieces, and in his telling, he landed the job. He first wanted to be a foreign correspondent, knew no English, so that kind of immediately took care of that, that fantasy. Um, and stormed into the editorial offices of, of Die Bühne, of the stage, one afternoon on a weekend when the theater critic and editor, uh, uh, Dr. Liebstöckel, was apparently having sex with his secretary. Um, Wilder interrupted that act and apparently Herr, Herr Liebstöckel turned to Wilder and said, it's, it's a good thing I was working overtime. At any rate, Wilder was immediately hired and began contributing crossword puzzles. Late in life, Wilder said that it really, you know, so he racks up these uh, six Academy Awards. That was something perhaps, but really his, his, his real pride is that he appeared in the New York Times crossword puzzle twice, once across and, and once down. Um, here's a picture of, of young Billy with the sort of the theater group and the, the Dr. Hans Liebstöck, the theater critic, um, who's uh, love in the afternoon, he apparently, you know, allegedly interrupted. Um, and this is the whole group around Max Reinhardt. Max Reinhardt was a great theater impresario in, in, in Vienna who ran the Theater in der Josefstadt, uh, which was a, a really, really influential theater. Most, if not all, actors and aspiring film, film professionals passed through Max Reinhardt's uh, theater uh, uh, in, in Vienna and then later the, 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 um, the Deutsches Theater in, in, in Berlin after after uh, Reinhardt left for, like Wilder from, from Vienna to Berlin, and then ultimately like Wilder to Hollywood, um, where he would direct among, among uh, other, other, other pictures, uh, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, so here, let me, let, me, let me continue. This is young Billy's uh, uh, visiting card from the period. Um, and he proudly pronounces himself a, re a reporter for, for Die Stunde. Um, one of the one of the early pieces that he wrote, and and again, I think you, anticipating the film work that he would later do in Hollywood, decades decades later, this is a, a piece that he wrote on the arrival of the Manchester-based all-girl band. The, uh, the they, they were a dance troupe actually. They didn't they didn't play, but the the, the Tiller Girls, um, uh, and this is one of the many pieces included in the in the collection. But I think you could get a, get a sense of the script that he would later write with Is Diamond, with I.L. Diamond uh, in, in the second half of the 1950s for Some Like It Hot. And you can see a number of flickers of later ideas in these early works. What brought him from Vienna to Berlin was meeting the great, it, jazz was, was Wilder's first, first love. And, 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 and what brought him there was meeting the, 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 the band, jazz band leader, Paul Whiteman, who was on the European, on the Vienna leg of his European tour. Wilder went and interviewed Whiteman wrote a piece on, I got a very flattering uh, piece on, on Whiteman. Uh, Whiteman was like that and asked him to tag along to the Berlin leg of the tour and to be something of a press agent. And so among the, the, the pieces included in the collection are, are a couple devoted to Whiteman, one from the Vienna leg, the other from the uh, 
the uh, uh, the, the the Berlin show um, at the Schulze Schauspielhaus, which was just a tremendous uh, show. Audiences uh, were, were, were packed in. Um, his performance of Rhapsody in Blue apparently had people on their feet, and the otherwise sort of aloof and standoffish Berliners were just in a state of rapture. Um, Here's a, a, a caricature that Billy Wilder did as a young reporter. He fashioned himself after the, this idea of a racing, a roving reporter. Um, and and, and the, this is my translation, not Shelley's, though she approved it. So I feel very flattered. Uh, a minute later, I'm standing in the hallway. I recap all details. Then I grab the pencil out of my breast pocket and hurl it into the basement two floors below. Wilder was constantly on, a, on the move. He was an inveterate pacer, uh, had, <laughs> was really, really restless. Um, and as we know, as I mentioned moments ago, he really wanted to kind of not only ace his way into pictures, but to get to America and to get there as fast as he possibly could. So one of the things that he did as a reporter was to kind of model himself on the hard-boiled American newspaper man. Um, I mentioned his work just, just, just in passing as a dancer for hire, but he did a, a, a four-part tell-all expose of that work um, that appeared in the Vienna, Viennese paper, he, he filed it back there, but it was in the Berliner Zeitung, a Mittag was the original publication. It was sort of in three, three installments, a serialized piece in which he described uh, his, his, his work at, at, a, at a posh Berlin hotel, the, uh, the Hotel Adlon, um, working as the dancer. He said he didn't have the best dance moves, but he had the best dialogue. Um, this is one of the early uh, scripts that he wrote. It's called the Teufel's uh, Reporter, a hell of a reporter, or or sometimes called the Devil Devil's Reporter. Um, this was for Ernst Lemle, who was Carl Lemle, the studio boss at Universal. This was his nephew, um, and and Wilder wrote the script for this piece based in large measure on his experiences as 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 a young freelance reporter. You have in the picture a a, and this is he's the second from left, him doing a cameo. Uh, not, not quite Hitchcock, but something of, 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 of the sort, wanting to make sure that he's there on screen, also modeling his, his sort of his, his uh, sartorial habits and, and, and the way in which he comports himself on, on the, uh, uh, the, you know, the great American hard-boiled uh, uh, reporter. Um, the film starred an American actor by the name of Eddie Polo, who played the, the lead role of this hard-boiled reporter. Um, Another picture, and I mentioned this early on, I'm moving as quickly as I can because I do want to speak with Nick and get into conversation about the larger scene in Hollywood and beyond the old old world, et cetera. But let me just, if I may, have us focus our attention briefly on the film that I mentioned. This was, in fact, it's funny, I have a poster behind me uh, of Edgar G. Omer. This was a, a, a series that I co-programmed at the Film Society of Lincoln Center uh when the book on omer that i wrote in 2014 appeared uh from the university of california press but omer was the co-director of this film there was also fred zinnemann who was working together with 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 uh uh, uh eugen schriftan who was the oldest man on the set he was barely 30. the others were in their early 20s and all of them were ultimately transplants hollywood transplants they did it on a shoestring budget really a kind of lemonade stand budget um, it, it presages the work of the of the Italian neorealists and the French New Wave. It's a beautiful and very lyrical picture. I'm going to show you one clip from it um, in, in, in just a second now, and it's based in 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 large measure on this piece that Wilder filed uh, as a as a as a young young reporter called Berlina Rendezvous, where he advises people where they might have the best afternoon. You know. Uh, uh, romantic trysts in the city. Uh, one of one of the places is the Normal Uhr, this oversized clock at the Berlin Zoologischer Garten uh, railway station. So I'm going to show you this this uh, clip right now. It's two minutes.
So there's the meet cute. Um, and uh, the, the, the film itself is something of a love letter to Berlin, um, just uh, three short years before the, the fascist uh, storm would change everything. Um, they're all non-professional actors used in, 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 in the film. Um, and a, a small plug for the Criterion Collection, but you, you, can, you can stream it there. Uh, I believe you may also be able to watch it on, on a few other platforms. Um, the film was released by Criterion. They did a restoration in, in, in 2011. I had the good pleasure of, of writing liner notes for that DVD release. It's just a, a, a beautiful film. Um, the the, the, the meet cute here, then they, they, they decide to have a, a, a date at one of the local uh, lakes just outside of, of Berlin, the Nicolasi. And uh, each one comes with a friend in tow and you have something of a double date. It's very frolicsome, very light, lots of levity. Uh, when again, as we now uh, sadly know, just a, a few years later, it become quite, quite dark. Uh, and those, those clouds are even brewing, I think, uh, around that time. Um, oh boy, there we go. I mentioned the, the, the uh, non-professional actors who play uh, on screen, play the same careers they occupied off screen. So Wolfgang is a, is a, a traveling wine salesman and something of a gigolo. <laughs> and I think Wilder, a little bit of wish fulfillment, Wilder, uh, uh, very much identified with Wolfgang. You have Crystal Ehlers, who's an aspiring uh, uh, actress and goes around Berlin, uh, as the as the uh, intertitles tell us, on a number of castings, but is has, hasn't yet uh, managed to to uh, land the big spot. And then Brigitte Borchert here is uh, she she works on Kufrist and Dam and a little uh, Electrola shop where. Uh, She's selling the the hit song in eine kleinen Konditorei in the little pastry shop uh, by the dozen. In fact, they bring the they bring a a, a portable uh, a player with them, and and one of the scenes at the lake is they're they're listening to records and and so forth. Um, I'm going to wrap things up here. This is a, a scene just after Wilder, a, a photograph rather, just after Wilder had made his way in in 1934 to Hollywood. You have Peter Lorre just behind him, who was his roommate. They uh, were said to have occupied for at least a short stretch of time the uh, women's anteroom, the, the, the anteroom to the women's bathroom at the Chateau Mermont. Um, and then they, 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 they continued as, as, as roomies. A number of these people on, screen, uh, on, on this uh, uh, image here, still image, um, were also holed up in Paris at the Hotel Ansonia which was something of a, a, uh, a, a way station for many people as they were getting their papers together, uh, the lucky ones who then were able to uh, gain passage from, most of them from Lisbon and then on, on to America. Um, Wilder uh, wrote a film, this was the last film before he became a, a, a director. And uh, th this is a film that's called Hold Back the Dawn, directed by Mitchell Lyson, in which he, relays not only the experiences at the Hotel Ansonia, but he then also, just after arriving in Hollywood in 34, he had a short-term studio contract um, and had to cross the border into Mexico. And he was holed up at another refugee hotel in Mexicali. And that forms the basis then of the script that he provided writing together with his writing partner, Charlie Brackett, um, of Hold Back the Dawn. Charles Boyer, who plays the lead in the film, who plays the Romanian dancer, who's also refugee, George Iscovescu, um, he refused to deliver a full page, maybe it was even two pages of dialogue that Wilder had written. At that point, he said, forget it. If they're not gonna, you know, if they're not gonna deliver my, my words, I'm gonna direct these films myself. And so it was just after that that he began his career as both a writer and director. Um, these are, of course, some of the films that we know best. On the left at the top, Double Indemnity, his uh, Pitch Perfect Noir. To the right of that, you have uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard with Gloria Swanson. Um, and and then and then below, of course, some like it hot from fifty nine, and to the right, you got Shirley MacLaine there and Jack Lemmon in the apartment. I end on that note, and uh, let's let's have our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, that was great. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> I hope I wasn't moving too fast. <laughs> there's there's a lot here. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the two of you on screen. I'll I'll be that you know headless, although you guys can all see me. Um, because I really, I, I love the idea of having the two of you together. There's, so it's fascinating how much um, all the lines of connection. And um, yeah. I'm gonna just throw a couple of things out. I'm sure you actually have some things so you can file these away and start with your conversation. But 
the, the two things I'm, I'm thinking about, one is um, certainly something I know that, that we all discussed, the fascination of the Jewish involvement, influence, and engagement in from the very beginning of, of the industry in Hollywood and even before Hollywood. Uh, and so, so just sort of that piece that's always been such a strong um, area of involvement, uh, you know, the, the Jewish involvement in the industry. The other thing that was so fascinating to me is that that both Billy and Herman got their start, you know, really reporting on theater and film before they fully were engaged in it, um, for, you know, sort of like the outside in and then from the inside out. So I'm, I'm curious about, I'm going to, I'm going to let the two of you talk <laughs> um, and invite some uh, others to, to share questions with me as we, as we move along. So thank you both. Thank you, Nick. You maybe want to take a swat at this one, but the other person who kind of follows a very similar career trajectory is Ben Hecht. And you have that letter to Ben yeah. saying, hey, look, get on out here. You're smart. You're, you're a great reporter. Yeah. Get here. You can make, make it big. Uh, and yeah. Well, I mean, there's... the only competition is a bunch of idiots. Yeah. What's so interesting is that, you know, uh, and Pauline Kael writes about this, that, that we all have this image of the hard-bitten newsman in the 20s, yeah, yeah. you know, and it seems like Wilder was that and Herman was that actually in he started in Berlin he went to Berlin and was at the Hotel Adlon and and you know so many connections there but um and then so all of these newspaper men um then went out to Hollywood and started writing movies about newspaper men yeah and it's like well did they create that or was was it really like that in the 20s and 30s or or was it just a, a creation of Hollywood um, I mean, yes. So uh, Rabbi Sue, Sue, the rabbi had a couple of good questions and we can start with the Jewishness. I mean, what's interesting, just, you know, th there's so many interesting things, but I mean, in Hollywood, you, 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 there, there, the phrase that the moguls used was hide the Jew. You, you did not want to reveal yourself to be Jewish. You did not want the world to know that these images and messages of America were being put out by these guys who used to be furriers and, and you know, streetcar conductors and stuff like that. And, and, you know, Herman loved to make fun of them for being furriers. And, and you know, I can't remember, I think it was Zukor who used to work on a street trolley and, and he would walk mm -hmm. by and, you know, Herman would go ding, ding, pay the fare, you know, and, and it's like, but you didn't want America to know that. So it was always about mom and apple pie and, and very American images. And the one time Herman tried to address it directly in his work, he wrote a, a, a play, uh, which he was going to turn into a movie, um, and uh, about the Nazis, and, and he was cleverly disguising Adolf Hitler by calling him Adolf Mittler. And, you know, it was, it was, and it was doomed to fail. I mean, it was this, this, uh, you know, a, a project he worked on for five years, beginning in 1930, actually started in 32. Um, and, but, you know, you couldn't bite the hand that fed them. And so there was such clear assimilation. And I'm curious how, how Wilder, uh, you know, dealt with that for, I mean, Herman was, Joe was a rip snorting atheist and said he's a rip snorting atheist. And in fact, all three of his wives, none of them were Jewish. Mm -hmm. um, and when he was buried and had his funeral, uh, it was at a church and, and I was walking through and I, I said to Ben, my cousin, I was like, wait a minute, aren't we Jewish? Like what's going on? Why? I thought we were Jewish. Um, but, but Joe's side of the family didn't think that. Um, so I'm curious how, you, you mean where a real Wilder church. was on that. A real, a real church, not Temple of Hanum. A real church, not Temple of Hanum. Right. Which, uh, my no, friend, like like called church. the church. Yeah, yeah right. right. No, no, no. He, he was, he was buried upstate. Um, yeah. no, I mean, his, I think he married a Catholic, a, a, a yeah. Protestant and an Episcopalian in, in that order. Um, the, the trifecta. Um, yeah. So a couple of things. One, I, I was laughing about the, the furrier. My, my paternal grandfather was a furrier from Krakow, was a Galiziano from, you know, that, that was the trade. That's what you went into. He didn't make his way to Hollywood. Um, but as for the notion about the Jews and their contribution and, and, and the sort of the extent of that and then sort of self-identification, um, for, for, the, for the Casablanca uh, a book I, I interviewed a lot of people, among them Andre Asiman, who wrote this wonderful memoir out of Egypt. And, and is a great, and then, and then, and then call, call, my, call Me By My Name, I think was the novel that then got adapted to a film. Anyway, wonderful critic and writer, 
who is originally from Alexandria, but has been in New York for a long, long time. We're talking about Casablanca. And the thing that he said about Casablanca, which I think really applies here, is he said, and he's using a somewhat highfalutin academic term, but he said there's, there's something of a structural absence in Casablanca. What he means by that is that the Jews, they're all over the screen, but nowhere in the picture. Right. And so, in other words, all of these <laughs> bit parts that were played in that film, and it was true in the, the whole story I've mentioned, uh, you know, Hold Back the Dawn, where Wilder's, you know, that the story is his experience in Mexicali in uh, being held right. up with a bunch of Jewish refugees, many of them from, from, from you know, Middle Europe, Central Europe, from, from, from Czechoslovakia, from, from Hungary, from Austria, from Germany, etc. Um, he writes that, and in fact, he then has Ch Ch Charles Boyer play the lead, uh, right. plays this Romanian dancer, and remember, right. my father was a dancer for hire, uh, George Iscovescu. So you have these sort of subtle allusions, but you can never speak to it really explicitly. And this is true essentially right. from the jazz singer up to Gentleman's Agreement. You just don't have explicit references to Jews on screen. They're there. <laughs> and the story. Oh, yeah. Right? And they're, they're yeah. everywhere off screen. And, and yeah. it, it, it's funny, it, it was one of the. We don't. I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but it was one of the di disappointments to me of of Mank. Right. Um, is that okay? I understand you need to get a star to play Herman, and maybe Michael Stuhlbarg isn't up for it. Mm -hmm. But um, so I, I get Oldman. But why does uh, you know Louis B. Mayer? Why can't mm -hmm. you get a, a Michael Lerner or, or somebody to play <laughs> Louis B. Mayer? Why choose a non-Jewish actor to play Louis B. Mayer? And and you know, look, Fincher, not Jewish, was attracted to the story. I get it. But there was an, there was such a Jewishness to Hollywood in the '30s and, and yeah. '40s, and and it's one of the things. Again, I don't want to mm -hmm. sidetrack it. And Mank has a lot to recommend it. And if people love it, I love them for it. Uh, I love the fact of the movie more than anything, but but there was an absence of sort of improvisational Jewish spirit in that right. movie that was like the essence of of Wilder and and the Mankiewiczs and in and the Epsteins and Hollywood in that time they were just they were just you know generating and and making stuff in the same way that they had made hats and and you know <laughs> draperies and everything else. Um, so, uh, and I think that was crucial to the Hollywood mismaking process, but it's true. You couldn't put it on the screen yeah. explicitly. And, and look, they were, uh, in the eyes of, of their parents, um, they were often thought of as sort of misfits in the sense that, you know, they didn't go on and pursue the noble profession as a lawyer or a doctor, or in fact, Wilder was under severe pressure from his parents to become a, a lawyer, which was the... The venerated uh, career path of good Jewish boys, mm -hmm. to some extent, girls were really good Jewish boys in in, in Vienna of that period, right. and he just resisted it. He was drawn to the world of tabloid journalism the way that he was drawn later to to, to motion pictures, and the way that a young boy or girl might be drawn to the circus. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that 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 that, that the circus affinity is an important one because i do think that it was something that was looked down upon early on and that's why i mean you talk about herman and how herman always thought that he was you know sort of better than these the you know the, well the, Her yeah. herman's father you know their father franz had instilled yeah. in them look yeah. you gotta do something serious and and he didn't understand the movies at all he yeah. he wouldn't go to the movies he would yeah. sometimes just go and watch the credits and watch their names and then leave because he didn't get it um, and and <laughs> he felt like they were wasting their lives. Um, and even as they became successful, or in Herman's case, success and then failure, and success and then failure, um, it just didn't it didn't resonate with the the previous generation um, to do anything other than be a doctor or lawyer or teacher. It's funny you reminded me of the reference to Franz and his kind of stern approach to 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 to, to the to the movies. Uh, another. Jewish transplant to Southern California in the 1940s. Theodore Adorno once wrote about the movies. He said, and I just paraphrased it, I, I love to go to the movies. It's what's on the screen that I have trouble with. But he liked the whole the sort of the act you know, for him to remind him of, you know, go, going to the uh, theater, maybe going to, to the symphony. He was a great writer on music. Um, uh -huh. But yes, it was always, or what well, should say always, but was largely snubbed by those who held kind of um, highbrow. Aspiration. Well, and, 
even in Hollywood, there was a certain set of Hollywood that, that obviously they all made their living in the movies, but they aspired to greater things or they wanted to go to the symphony and they would have museums. Yeah. And, you know, it was all about something better. And, and you know, Herman, <laughs> Herman said once like, your your thing uh, reminded me of uh, like you know well try to stay at least four blocks away from any theater where my movies are playing because you never know a storm might drive you into the theater <laughs> but if you're four blocks away you'll be safe um while there you know, was yeah go on no go ahead go ahead I was gonna say, there was this, there's, there's one intersection between joe and and billy that we, oh. we have to get to but what okay. were we gonna say Maybe we'll get there. I'm not sure. What I'm saying is may not be the link, but we'll see. Wilder from the very beginning, because he loved sports and you know boxing in particular, and loved the races and loved gambling, the movies were just a paradise for him. And he had no problem for him. He was first and foremost an entertainer. From the time that he begins to write as a 19 year old, write for these, the tabloid press, it was all about entertaining an audience. That's what he wanted to do. So he didn't. It didn't bother him in the slightest. And he used to make fun of those people who were trying to make, you know more cerebral and, and 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 also you know so for kane in the case of kane you know that sort of virtuosity that kind of visual style greg toland's camera behind the fireplace wow there's like that he's not doing any of that he he's there right. to entertain and so he didn't that, yeah. that didn't that didn't bother him but the uh i had one other funny story if i may about because somehow the, the adorno thing in music and then i thought about wagner and 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 how, i don't ask me why on sunday i'm thinking about wagner but but while there once remarked and i just love this because i think it kind of captures his plucky spirit and and his irreverence he said he went with his wife audrey to go to the ring and he says the concert began at at, at eight this you know i don't know whether it was lincoln center wherever it was concert began at eight three hours later he looked at his watch and it was eight fifteen. Um, <laughs> so right. his, his sort yeah. of irreverence when it comes to high art, high music, and, and and all of that. I love that, like like a bored teenager. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's uh, funny. Uh, I think Wilder seems, and I could be totally wrong, but he seemed to have much more of a common touch than either of the Mankiewicz brothers ever really had. I mean, Herman, I think in some ways was sort mm -hmm. of more towards that and more towards being a natural entertainer. But I think Joe was Joe was really in his head. Mm -hmm. um, and was was trying, I, I think he was totally determined to entertain audiences, but I don't think it was as natural to him uh, as it was to Billy Wilder. Right. He mentioned um, All, and, All About and Eve so, is, a great, is, a great, is a great film. All About Eve. Yeah, it's he a great, yeah, yeah, All About Eve, is, it's a fantastic, yeah. look, he made lots of great movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, my, my, you know, seven and eight-year-old in me who didn't understand what Joe did, I mean, Joe had an incredibly great career um, and made terrific films after terrific films. I think All About Eve is clearly his masterpiece, but um, uh, so in for the Academy Awards in 1950, I guess 450 in 1951, uh, you know, Joe won for best adopted screenplay because it was based on a short story. Billy Wilder won for best original screenplay. And the tension between the Mankiewicz brothers was such that, um, you know, Herman always would sort of deride Joe for never having written original stuff that was all adaptations mm -hmm. and stuff, um, and which is, it's all very sad. I mean, they're, they're, competition. Um, but anyway, Joe and, and Billy were two of the five Mm -hmm. white men who were up for best director and they were chatting with each other and oh what an honor to be included with you billy and oh isn't this great and obviously and joe later said he didn't think he had a chance of winning best director and as soon as his name is announced he cuts billy off like a shot pushes him out of, literally pushes him out of the way and goes to accept the award and and wilder was stunned and he said he had never seen pure ambition like that before mm -hmm. in his life mm -hmm. um which made me you know wonder if maybe he never saw all about eve because it's a portrait of raw ambition which comes i think from the essence of, of joe's own soul but um i think both of the, the mankowitz brothers uh could have learned quite a lot from billy wilder <laughs> <laughs> And vice versa. I mean, Wilder does have there are a couple of films that they're not his his, his uh, most beloved, but that show a a uh, you know a kind of root, ruthless ambition. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, for instance, of Kirk Douglas and Ace in the Hole. And for yeah. that, it, for him, it's there another another you know hard boiled newspaper man, but who's willing to compromise or just set aside all scruples, all all morals 
in order to 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 get the scoop in order to get the get the get the story um you know i even even well even, there's something so even joe deeply, gillis hmm? yeah i was going to say there's something deeply soulless about mm-hmm. the sunset boulevard yeah but yeah. it's it's so weird and twisted um that you feel like the person who's making it has a soul even if those characters are so uh, twisted and distorted yeah but william holden's you know his 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 joe 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 gillis is another you know struggling writer who's willing you know if if, if his meal ticket's going to come from from norma desmond well yeah. that's fine and you know if it's in a house that that has uh dead monkeys and and uh and 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 and, and eric von stroheim as a as, as a butler uh hey it it works um yeah. I was thinking about the story you told from the 1950 or 51, I guess, for the slate of pictures from 50, but the 51 Oscars. There's a similar story, and sorry, I keep referencing that holy grail of of, of uh, classical Hollywood, Casablanca. But when when uh, uh, Hal Wallace was to receive the Academy Award for Casablanca, Jack Warner immediately jumps up and sort of <laughs> pushes him aside and. And, and and makes his way to the stage. So there's that. That's another, you know, uh, uh, I think yeah. portrait of of raw ambition. Well, Hollywood and, and is tactlessness is, and famous and famous tactlessness. Famous tactlessness. Yeah. I mean, look, it, you know, what makes uh, Sammy run? I mean, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Hollywood yeah. is is a place famous for uh, raw ambition. Oh yeah. I mean, that's the best example. Sammy Glick, uh, Schulberg's yeah. uh, protagonist, is the paragon yeah. of. St- st- climbing over you know clawing his way to the top and stepping over that's a great novel by the way people i think it's are no longer reading it uh, today as, as they once did uh but it's it, it's, a, it's a fantastic novel and and you know there were many people who thought that sammy glick was was based on joe mankowitz um yeah. i'm not sure that there's any real evidence for that but um but certainly that portrait of raw ambition sort of rings true um, I mean, I wanted to investigate in, in my book whether or not Joe did in fact have a soul, and I, I think he very much did. Uh, and he certainly had a heart that was broken, you know, multiple times. But he had difficulty in his human uh, relationships, mm-hmm. to say the least. Well, they didn't uh, know what to do with that 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 kind of uh, uh, a diagnosis at the time, maybe as much as they do now. Maybe 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 he just needed to be better medicated. Um, <laughs> I'm going to leave that. My sister's a neurologist. Thankfully, she took the bullet. Uh, I didn't need to go into the medical profession. I'll need to good. confer yeah. with her on that one. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's interesting, these kinds of affinities and, and, and the larger story that, 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 that Rabbi Sue was, was sort of the, the sort of point of departure here about Jews in Hollywood and the ways in which they kind of navigate that world and the ways in which they become sort of the arbiters of taste for, you know, American culture. Yeah. But it's usually stripped of any sort of ethnic or, or you know, uh, at least visible uh, ethnic or religious um, ties yeah um, you don't want to admit that that your characters are jewish you don't right. want to admit that you are jewish you know right whereas in bud schulberg's novel uh what makes sammy run i mean it is just shot through with 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 with, with the you know not only the, the jewish you know protagonist of sammy glick but that whole world is character and in fact if i'm not mistaken i think it was louis b mayer who is just furious with bud schulberg for publishing the same way that he was furious with billy yes. wilder yeah. For, for for Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. And uh and, and used quite a few epithets and telling him that he like it was Mayor also who said to to uh to, to Herman or was it to Joe that he'd never work a day another day in Hollywood. Um but he he, he uttered something very similar, at least we're gonna print the legend on that one, but uttered something yeah. very, very similar after seeing Sunset Boulevard and the way yeah. that Hollywood was kind of uh pilloried in, in the eyes of, 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 uh, well, I think Louis B. Mayer also had an image of what Hollywood needed to be. And everybody had to sort of uphold these standards and mother, the, the primacy of mother and everything. Mm-hmm. And so no, Joe had a falling out with him over Judy Garland because mm-hmm. J- Joe got Judy Garland into analysis and was trying to help Judy Garland, you know, deal with her issues and get away from Louis B. Mayer. And finally, the two of them fought and, and uh, you know, this studio is not big enough for the both of us and, and <laughs> he fired Joe. Uh, but Joe's agent was able to get him a, a good sort of landing spot at Fox, which which is where Joe finally was able to do what Wilder was able to do, which is direct. Because he didn't want to write. He didn't want to yeah. have people ruining his words. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's, it's funny, in, in a lot of, including Joe Gillis, uh, Bill Holden's character in, in Sunset Boulevard, there are a lot of writers, we know the fate of the writer, you know, the fate that, that, that is then, uh, 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 you know, sort of re-inhabited in, in, in Robert Altman's The Player, you know, the, the, the writer, you're either face down in a swimming pool, you're face down right. in a puddle, in the case of Altman's The Player, and, right. and I mean, that is a story that I think is, 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 um, you know, was felt by a lot of, it's not just a story. I mean, the story in the meantime has been retold, but it was an actual experience that I think a lot of writers in Hollywood felt. Um, let's go back. To yeah, it was a, it, yeah, it was the sucker's game. I mean, yeah. it, which Herman recognized instantly, but didn't either have the ambition to direct or didn't sort of, I think he thought movies were so silly that it was just like, why would you want to do the the, the harder job mm -hmm. or, or the or the more exhausting job anyway whereas this way you sit around in a room with people you drink you yeah gamble you know and then you get to go home to your family yeah. can, yeah, I, you can I throw in a, a question for a second along those lines just uh sure. sorry to be this again headless oh, of course. <laughs> um I'm curious how much of you know what you're talking about is you, you mentioned this is uh you know sort of a different career path than maybe many Jewish parents encouraged or hoped for, expected. And I, I wonder, you know, I, I'm thinking again about the, the meteoric s success of Jews in Hollywood and how much of it was, well, we're gonna show them, um, or was it just, what is it, is there something about that? Um, also is thinking about Billy Wilder coming from Vienna and, and all of the, those uh, Jews who came uh, either early or post World War II, and and the influence that that group had as well, you know, really setting up shop in Southern California. And was it was it survival? Was it a um, a uh, a need to you know say we're we're we are going to be successful at this just as we would in another career path? Or was it setting something? Was it something totally different? I don't know. Um, just thinking about those those ideas. Yeah, before before Hitler's rise to power, you had a number of of, of not only the moguls themselves, but you had a number of, of of writers and directors who'd already crossed the Atlantic because that was an opportunity. So for them, it wasn't survival; it was a chance at even greater success. I'm thinking, for instance, of Ernst Lubitsch, who was one of the great, and it was the really the role model par excellence for Wilder. Always had a, had a uh, big sign in his in his office on on Sunset Boulevard. Uh, yeah, what, Joe what, too. Joe loved Lubitsch. Yeah. I mean, what would Lubitsch do? Was the was yeah. the sign? What would yeah. Lubitsch do? And and Lubitsch was the great role model. And but but Lubitsch came at a time when, you know, the, the Nazis weren't in, yet in, yet in power, um, and he saw great opportunity and took it. Um, the, the 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 people of of Wilder's generation who crossed the Atlantic in the '30s and even into the 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 the, the '40s. Um, they were escaping the Nazi regime. Uh, one of the things that's come up ab about Wilder's early journalism, people ask the question, you know, so, and this is sort of a little bit of a thought experiment and perhaps a silly one, but you know, what, what, ha what if there had never been uh, national socialism and there had been no Hitler or Mittler, um, <laughs> but, uh, but it, you know, what, would, what, what do you think would have happened with Wilder? I, I, I'm really quite convinced, but of course this requires, you know, considerable con conjecture on my part, but I'm really quite convinced he, he would have stayed and, and written in his mother tongue. Um, one of the reasons that he, from the very get-go, had American-born or American-raised writing partners and, you know, Ch Ch Charles Brackett and later Is Diamond and a bunch of people in between, including Raymond Chandler, et cetera, was that he didn't have real command of the English language. I mean, he was very, very funny and he spoke with a super thick accent. Um, Bogey once uh, teased him about that accent on the set of Sabrina and it drove him to distraction. But um, he would have, I'm sure, continued to write in his native tongue. It's one of the hardest things that, that happened to these to the refugees, not, you know, be, beyond, of course, having your life threatened by, by uh, uh, national socialism, was that your tool, the tools of your trade were suddenly gone. You didn't, you know, your language was, was, was gone. And you so, know, I was struck by yeah. that, that clip that you showed. I mean, I've yeah. never seen that movie, but what yeah. a beautiful and lyrical yeah. and just like, what a gorgeous piece of, of filmmaking. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm not a wilder, you know, a student or anything, but like, I, I, I love that more than almost anything I've seen in Wilder's work because it's, <laughs> it's, it, it feels like, 
Okay, so that's him expressing himself in his native tongue in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 I guess there he had to, you know, do certain things in order to write in English yeah. or, you know, was a yeah. writing partner. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the other thing, uh, uh, Herman, uh, Joe got his start at, at UFA also. In, yeah. in, I mean, so like it was, it was a, a very robust film industry. And I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it was rivaled only by Hollywood. So yeah. Ufa's I mean, only rival was Hollywood. Yeah. They're, they're, I mean, obviously great films came out of there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting to think of all the other things that would have happened. What would have happened had, yeah. had you know, to the German film industry yeah. and, and Wilder and all that. I think the other thing is, you know, Jewish tradition is founded upon, uh, you know, the written word and stories. So I think it's sort of natural that so many of these guys gravitated towards this new 20th century uh, form of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, because that was, that was part, that was baked into the, the, uh, cultural tradition that they came from. Yeah. And many of the writers we should we should emphasize here since we're otherwise just talking about these the the the, the fellas here, but, but but many of the of the writers who made their way to Hollywood and really were were, were great successes were women. I'm thinking yeah. for instance of Vicky Baum who wrote, you know, Grand uh -huh. Hotel among other among other it was initially of this runaway bestseller novel, but she too like Wilder was 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 working for the in in Berlin. It was the Ulstein concern, this big publishing concern that that published the Berliner Zeitung am Mittag as well as Tempo, which was is a very good, uh, well well named uh, publication aimed at the youth set. And while there was a perfect fit for Tempo, um, that apparently they dubbed, they called it, it, it instead of calling Tempo, they would jokingly refer to it as Jüdische Hast, which is Jewish haste. So that they, you know, sort of the speed. Um, and in fact, in 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 the the Teufel's Reporter, Hell of a Reporter, or Devil's Reporter, um, the, the 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 tabloid to which Eddie Polo, the character that Eddie Polo plays, contributes, it's called Rapid or Rapide. So they just sort of based it basically on, on, on tempo. But a number of the writers who came out of there were, were women, and and who ended up you know writing for 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 the movies as well uh, in in America. Um, there's a lovely memoir by Salka Fiddle called The Kindness of Strangers, the New York Review of Books Classics just reissued. Um, and that captures, I think, that larger world. They would meet on Sundays, including Lubitsch. Wilder would attend them as well, the Mann brothers and so forth, Bertolt Brecht. And, and she would hold these sort of salons on, on, on a Sunday afternoon with the, with the German-speaking sort of refugee set. Um, and, and Salka Fiddle was a great screenwriter as well, in addition to being the handler of Greta Garbo. Um, but so there, the, you know, I think the written word is really at a very important point that you make. It, it, you know, it's it's all about the word. Um, yeah. But I do also think that that the 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 um, the affinity with entertainment is is important. Not just, I mean, certainly specific to Wilder, but not merely specific to him. I think that mm -hmm. the first it was entertaining on stage, and when then the, the the motion pictures became an outgrowth of the theater, that 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 propensity to entertain and to perform and make believe. I mean, as the late. Peter Bogdanovich once said that, you know, motion pictures, they're a fabulous paradise. He was referring to Edgar Omer, who's, who's haunting me, uh, you know, who is the co-director of, 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 of People on Sunday. Um, mm -hmm. But it was a place where you, and he said it because Omer was, an, uh, <laughs> among other things, the, uh, the, the, the greatest liar in the history of motion pictures, as Lottie Eisner once said of him. Um, mm -hmm. And 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 the motion pictures are you know it it, it is the well it's it, it, yeah is it is it truth twenty four times a second or is yeah. it a lie twenty four <laughs> times a second I mean I, I think, think more likely the latter even though the the former yeah. sounds better well there's no such I, but there's no such thing as I think that was you know, Godard right he said truth yeah Godard yeah. yeah but um yeah I mean that's and and certainly I mean look Wells took so much from the Germans I mean mm -hmm. he 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 studied those films oh so. yeah absolutely. And in fact, I think, I know Hitchcock was over, you know, sort of apprenticing at Ufa mm -hmm. in Berlin. Right. I think right. Wells, either he was impacted via, via his collaborators. I can't remember who he'd actually crossed the Atlantic. I mean, he did later for sure. Yeah. Um, and, and, and did a lot of overseas productions, especially when he was lacking the funding that he needed in Hollywood. He, you know, like Omer actually too, crossed the Atlantic to get, you know, get the Germans to support right. the, the, right. The, the French, et cetera. Right. So just a, um, a question from one of our listeners, uh, wondering how um, how Billy Wilder, the Mankiewicz brothers, others uh, fared during the Hollywood blacklist period. Were they That's impacted by that? How to, <laughs> you're both question. nodding, so I'm gonna let you 
Go at it. Do you want to go first, Nick? I don't, I, either way. Well, yeah, I mean, Joe was the head of uh, essentially the, the, uh, the guild. It was the head of the, of the Writers Guild, which or what became the Writers Guild, then called the Screenwriters Guild. And there was a very famous incident where he stood up to uh, the blacklist. He was a Republican, Joe was, but um, um, it, but you know there they there was a, a whole movement um, led by Cecil B. DeMille and others where uh, they they were insisting on loyalty oaths. Mm -hmm. um, and Joe uh, said, "This is this is a slippery slope. We we can't we can't have this." Um, and so it all came to a head at this, this tremendously dramatic meeting, uh, of, of the guild where, um, I think it was, I can't remember what, yeah, it was Cecil B. DeMille. And, and he started calling out, uh, the names of some of the writers. And rather than say William Wyler, he would say William Weiler, yeah, Freddie yeah. Zimmerman, and okay. did this sort of horrible, you know, accent and the room turned on him and started hissing and, and the thing was shut down. So in fact, Joe was never blacklisted. By then, Herman was kind of really out of the game and was on his way to uh, the grave. Uh, so he wasn't blacklisted. Interestingly, my other grandfather, my father's father was a screenwriter and he was blacklisted um, because he was a member of the Communist Party in the thirties. <laughs> and because he liked going to parties. I mean, it really, he wasn't a, a particularly ideal, logical um, uh, kind of guy, Frank Davis, but he was blacklisted and um you know a lot of uh, there were a lot of people who it was the thing to do would be to join the communist party in the 30s um lucille ball you know and um so but no but neither mankowitz was was actually officially blacklisted yeah and a lot of that came out also from the, the, the if you traveled and there were of course the fellow travelers but if you traveled in certain circles uh workers theater and and uh, and also those you know the Yiddish speakers in in you know New York as well in New York and other uh, cities, but they were strongly impacted I think by the not necessarily communist ideology but com the communism was the kind of the cultural mode through which they expressed themselves and was a supporter of the you know Arbeiter Theater and that sort of stuff the workers theater and 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 uh, the Bund. Um, and so, sure, it was a natural, I think, affinity, depending upon where you came from, depending upon your kind of cultural sensibility and that sort of thing. For Wilder, because he was such a mainstream direct and sense, he really, I mean, self-consciously, I think he wanted to reach the widest audience possible. He shied away from anything that was too risky, I think. It was later that he mm -hmm. offended a lot of people, but that's just because he, he, he uh, you know, kind of pushed the envelope on censorship and also... Uh, really, I think, threw some some sand in the eyes of audiences when it came to puritanical morality. If you think, for instance, of a movie like Kiss Me Stupid with uh, Kim Novak. Uh, yeah, and he took he took major heat for for, for, for that movie. Yeah. Um, and, and, and a few others as well, where, I mean, even Ace in, the, Ace in the Hole with, uh, that, that I mentioned moment wow. before with Kirk Douglas playing a newspaper reporter in, in, in New Mexico. And um, audiences didn't want to be... And this is funny, in a way, it's kind of a not a, not a terribly Wilderian uh, reflex. But in this particular instance, I think he was willing to take um, in both of those, actually, Kiss Me Stupid. And then earlier in, in, in Ace in the Hole, I think he was willing to brush against the grain a bit there. Uh, but at, with respect to the question of, of the, the blacklist, I, I don't, you know, he had friends who were certainly leftists, um, but he... He, he managed to elude that entirely, whereas so many others did not. And in fact, many of his, you know, sort of the German speaking Central European set, it was so awful for them that many of them uh, uh, end up returning to Europe permanently. Wilder mm. went back and he directed, you know, a Foreign Affair with Marlene Dietrich, one of his, you know, dear friends, lifelong friends. Um, you know, cast her again in, in witness for the prosecution. What's the, um, I'm sorry, this is yeah, sort of what, it, what is completely off the topic. What, what's the one with Jimmy Cagney as the Coca Cola? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, one, does that hold up? <laughs> one, two, three. See, I think it does. It's hilarious, actually. I think it yeah. does, and I think it really does. Uh, again, that was a kind of a uh difficult position to take for Wilder and, and to work with Cagney, who was famously conservative. Yeah. Um, but this critique of capitalism and you yeah. have the, the, the Helmut Dantina character, uh, who's, who's, uh, who, who, you know, who just spouts the, the sort of, is, he's quoting, you know, from Das Kapital and quoting from Marx left and, oh, really? huh. and, and, and right. 
Um, and I misspoke, Helmut Antinas, and now I'm getting, Casablanca and one, two, three have suddenly become one. Um, it's not Helmut Antinas, another, another German immigrant actor, now I'm blanking on his name. But anyway, that it does hold up, I think. It, 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 it's quite funny, and I think it, it still has a certain timeliness in terms of what we're willing, you know, look at Amazon, look at other sort of, in this case, it's Coca-Cola capitalism, but right. today we have our own versions of that. Right. I'd like to see that. One, two, three. And it's it's really funny. It was my late father-in-law who was from Czechoslovakia. He he loved that movie. Yeah, yeah. That was a favorite of his because it also captures the, you know, the 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 dividing of East and West Germany and the wall right. and, and right. all of that. So it's right. it's it, at the very least, it's great as a sort of a what the Germans would call a site document, a kind of a, a, a document that captures a moment in time. Right. Well, that's what's great about the clip you showed. I mean, I, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. I mean, you before you even said it, it's just sort of heartbreaking to watch Berlin in 1930. Yeah, and yeah. See this city and know what's coming. It's yeah, uh, really well, unbelievable. Yeah, in a weird way, it's a disadvantage that we do know because they they had no idea. And so no, they're of course not. The city that they love. Yeah. And so we, of yeah. course, have you know, yeah. hindsight and can see what we know what's coming. But yeah. There's one scene in the film where you have Prussian soldiers marching in the Tiergarten in one of the big parks, and but that's the only reference to sort of militarism. And you have an old man who's sitting, and you have all these sort of these these monuments or memorials of of, of fallen soldiers, and he kind of salutes them, but not not a Nazi salute. Right. That's right. the only reference you get to a kind of a militaristic tradition. The rest is just all, you know, kind of filled with a buoyant spirit. You know, lots mm -hmm. of lots of sort of frolics and uh, romance and uh, other forms of just, you know, kind of uh, amusement and, and levity and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't, you know, not, I mean, not this, weighed down. The thing that, that I, in just thinking about that, I think, I feel like this, one of the things that unites these three guys is mm -hmm. this kind of sensibility of, of a, a European civilization mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, should be maintained and that people should behave in that way and people should be classy and you know and 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 erudite and civilized and and educated um and you know it, it doesn't always work out but. yeah I mean, uh, and that was actually i was go gonna ahead. if i could just throw in for a second um that that's what i was going to ask you is sort of our you know as we we start to to wrap soon but not yet don't worry um but but the legacy that they that they leave and certainly when we look at hollywood today and i'm thinking about um my my youngest who she's only 14 but an aspiring screenwriter and thinking about you know uh the the legacy of um of you know all of this and and there's a there's a great um uh if you take a look at the chat a note mm -hmm. in there from rona um, but but wondering about that that legacy for for the next generation and especially if they maybe unless they look and and make the intentional uh, you know effort to to watch these and to to read and to learn about this history what what is the legacy how do we how do we continue not just through your books but um, but in other ways as well to to share that. Oh God, the motion picture industry has changed so radically from yeah. the time that, that, that Joe and Herman Mankiewicz and Billy Wilder were, you know, occupying a very prominent position within it. So, but I teach, you know, here, I'm speaking to you from Austin right now. We just had our commencement on Friday and our students, many of them go on to, to, to write uh, either out West or from here or head, head East to New York. Um, and they're still, lots of different ways in which one can pursue a career as a as a screenwriter um or as these days one might say a, a, a content creator a content creator <laughs> yeah yeah that's what i'm gonna say a content creator i mean i think that you know the the quote-unquote movies have changed so much but given yeah. the different kinds of outlets and the television you know that exists today on streaming television i mean my daughter right now i think i, I heard her earlier she's watching gaslit Oh yeah, um, which is you know it, I don't want to say it's Mankiewiczian or Wildarian, but it's it's awfully good and and it's a, a you know a seven or whatever part series about the Watergate scandal seen from a very particular interesting uh, point of view and the scripts are interesting and weird and and full of characters who are you know humane and and not superheroes and 
um, I mean, not literally superheroes and also, you know, flawed and, and, and problematic in the way that, that these guys wrote uh, characters who were flawed and problematic. So um, I think, you know, th th their legacy is, is there, I think, more right. than it is in movies now. I think that, that television has taken the mantle. Um, and it's funny you mentioned one, two, three. I mean, the reason one, two, three, I think I saw it one day when I was sick, you know, home from school and I was like, what is this? And I just watched it. I couldn't believe it. And then I never saw it or heard it again. And then when Mad Men came on, I was yeah. like, Hey, wait a minute. What was that movie? You know, and I, yeah. I, but I never bothered to sort of look it up and I, I kept hearing about it. But I mean, I do think that, that, that kind of intelligent screenwriting is, is still very much possible. It's just on different screens. Yeah, I mean, the legacy definitely continues in, well, you mentioned Mad Men, but also in, in, in other movies is the, the, uh, the um, I think he was of, of a Romanian family, but the French director who directed the, the artist when he won his award. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he, he stood up and said, I'd like to thank three people. Billy Wilder, Billy Wilder, Billy Wilder is what he said. Right, so I mean, the, right, the, the, right. the impact continues, I think, in, 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 I mean, there very explicitly, but I think also just in sort of styles of storytelling, characters, mm -hmm. um, sensibility, sense of humor. Um, so, so, I mean, it, it does continue. It's just that the, 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 the industry has changed so radically. Right. And Wilder tried to continue to work all the way into his, long after many, most of his collaborators had passed away, but into the eighties, you know, he vied, it's funny, you asked the question earlier on, Rabbi Sue, about the sort of Jew Jewishness of these figures and Wilder was definitely not from, but he was, did have that European sensibility, Nick, that you were describing. He almost always was wearing a hat and it wasn't mm. to cover his head before God. He just, they just thought that was this, you know, that, that, that was the proper way of, of, you know, the, the, they matched his sartorial habits and that was the proper right, way of, right, of, of, right. of dressing. Yeah. But well, it's interesting. I mean, to his credit, he kept working and I, I don't know, you know, I'm not as familiar obviously with his. Yeah credits and, and when his last great one was you know whether well, well he vied with spielberg for schindler he wanted to direct schindler but at that point in time it was the as wilder referred to them the young guys with beards who were taking over you know the coppola right. spielberg right Scorsese, etc yeah. the new the new yeah. hollywood and yeah. so he he he, could, he couldn't get it but he wanted to he'd lost his mother stepfather and grandmother right. in the death ah. camps he fed a very very strong attachment to the to the to the subject and wanted right. to, to kind of take it up. He had directed just after the war, uh, excuse me, supervised, didn't direct. It was a it was a Czech filmmaker by the name of Hanush Berger. Hanush was actually my late father in law's given name for Hanush in, in German. They would call him Hans. But um, and and uh, it was a movie that was called it's, it was had very didactic. It was aimed at reeducation and denazification in Germany right after the war. And it shows these sort of piles of dead bodies from the camps. It was called Totismüll and Death Mills, and he supervised that. So while there was still very you know a, 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 acutely aware of mm. what 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 happened to his family and to to, to Jews throughout throughout Europe, right. Um, and in a wilder sort of, you know, in his, his, his sort of gallows humor, he once said, he said that, you know, there, there were uh, optimists and there were pessimists. He said the, the optimists, they, they died in the death camps. He said the pessimists have swimming pools in their backyards in, in Beverly Hills. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or uh, Palm Springs. I mean, I, I think that, um, but, but, you know, just the fact that he kept going, he kept working, whereas Joe, I mean, Herman yeah. died, but then Joe... You know, after Joe made Sleuth in 1972, he lived another 20 years and didn't didn't do anything. I mean, he, yeah. he tried to write, he tried to get all the president's men, but he asked too many questions and he just sort of frittered that one away. But, um, but and he he said, you know, I don't want to be like Billy Wilder. Like, he, mm -hmm. I think he said, like, I saw Buddy yeah. Buddy and it's embarrassing. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Do that. that was you know, sad. Yeah, it was, it is it's sad and it's, yeah. it's you know, but what do you what's better to go make a movie that doesn't succeed with the public or sit home stewing and you know taking codeine i mean i'm i'm not sure that that billy wilder didn't have a sort of better recipe for living you know mm -hmm. um it, there's a lovely novel that was written by the british novelist jonathan coe called mr wilder and me and it's it's largely on the, the production of Fedora, which was another late picture of his, which I think is va vastly underrated and actually really, really fascinating. A wonderful yeah. double bill with uh, Sunset Boulevard, sort of another Sunset Boulevard story. 
But uh-huh. Jonathan Coe kind of gets inside. He has a, there's a, a young woman who is the who is the uh, protagonist in the book called Callista, who's this Greek Greek British woman, and it's it's a great it's a great read. I mean, of course, I'm the <laughs> I'm, I'm biased that I'm sort of the target audience for this novel, but it's right. it's, it's really lovely. Right. It's just come out from. Uh, it wasn't uh, strangely unlike many of his other novels. It had not yet been published by an American publisher, but now it's out from I think Europa Editions. Um, Mr. Wilder and me. It's it's and and it's about aging and it's about the the, the difficulty of getting back. You know, for that movie too, he had to go and get European. Right. And it was mainly German right. backing for Fedora. Uh, right. And there was the guy who'd lost his, you know, family in the camps, and and he's you know going with an outstretched arm, getting collecting their money to produce the picture because the Americans mm. are no longer going to do it after mm. you know Kiss Me Stupid and some other movies that hadn't really done right. terribly right. well at the, at the at the box office. Huh. Interesting. So I want to um I'm going to come on here. I uh I I'm sure we could continue the conversation. Um, and I hope that you both will, and and we'll look forward to, who knows, maybe some future collaboration. But um, but I I know that I now have I, I've added or re-added uh, a number of movies to my you know watch list. Things some that I haven't seen in a in a while, but some also that really uh, that that you've referenced that um, that sort of adds to the fullness of of this legacy that that you've both shared and. Uh, just fascinating to to have the conversation or to be a fly on the wall as you have the conversation about uh, about what um, what each of these uh, gentlemen added to uh, what we see today, um, and and I think that also speaks to our Jewish experience of not just telling the story but remembering the story and and recognizing mm. the contributions of each generation. Um, to what we have, and and to to not just acknowledge that, but to to honor it, to celebrate it, which you both certainly have in uh, such meaningful ways. So I want to I want to thank you not only for your books and just uh, a reminder to everyone. I'll just put it one more time um, in the chat. Uh, I encourage you um, just to, it's fascinating stories and reflections on you know in in the same way as that that clip that we. Um, that we got to see of of a, a world that that is is gone, uh, and certainly a um, that you know we we uh, that you've captured so eloquently and uh, and honored on your on your pages and certainly in your your words today. So I just I want to thank you both Noah Eisenberg and Nick Davis for for being with us today and for your respective books, Billy Wilder on assignment. Thank you, Noah, <laughs> and competing with idiots. Thank you, Nick. Um, and, uh, and we look forward to hopefully the next time, uh, being able to be in person. We, uh, we thank the Jewish Book Council. I'm excited this coming week. I don't know if either of you are involved this year. I haven't looked at the full list yet, but we have the, uh, the Jewish Book Council has their annual conference. So, uh, always, uh, as, as I had the opportunity along with several other members of our staff to, to hear you both last year, uh, with that, um, your engaging two minute feel <laughs> <Our elevator pick. laughs> and yeah, so much elevator. better to have it in the fullness that we've, we've had today so i just yeah. want to thank you both again for thank you me. this was really fun and Noah, it was great meeting you and, and thank you thank you so much yeah. very nice and 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 uh rabbi shankman you'd make a great uh press agent that was very nice <laughs> at the end you're really i, I was uh, getting give the credit with... too. that was another i'm sorry but one last thing a very funny coincidence because herman was the press agent for isadora duncan and billy wilder was a, like these guys were like they were yeah. just like you know press agents for artists like See? sydney like sydney falco and uh, sweet, sweet smell of success tony curtis's character exactly. the, uh, yeah the bags the, the cats in the bag the bags in the room yeah, yeah right right uh, well, thank you. Great both. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, have a great afternoon, everyone.